Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Clint Cowles. Clint is from uh, TD Ameritrade Institutional based in Minneapolis. He's going to talk to us a little bit about large versus small, which is a theme that many of us have been sort of struggling with, right? You've had this leadership from small micro cap names really emerging. That's where a lot of the uh, opportunities have been. What does that look like going forward, right? Where should we be thinking about uh, sort of risk on versus risk off when you think about cap tiers? Where would the opportunities necessarily be? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday as we break down the markets using technical analysis, using the message baked into the charts, focus on long-term trends and how they're evolving. And most importantly, how the short-term movements of today, the flickering ticks, the market volatility intraday, how that relates to the long-term trends. You know, it's so easy to get sucked into short-termism, sucked into the movements of the day, what's working and what isn't. And while that's something I often talk about, leaning into what's working, leaning away from what's not working, remember that's on a time frame that's in line with your investment horizon. So if you're a longer-term investor, that's where we're trying to focus. Let's focus on those trends, how those trends are evolving uh, over the longer term. Sort of a choppy day. I'd call this a digestion day. Uh, many things were down, but sort of as the day went on, you had sort of uh, a mixed bag of sorts. We're going we're gonna to look at uh, across the board on the different asset classes, but the S&P is essentially finishing flat. So we'll look at that. what that means. Heavy earnings week. So we're going to focus on two stocks, Uber and Lyft, relate the two of them together. They both have earnings coming out yesterday and today. Uh, we'll see what the charts say about those two names and, uh, and what other conclusions we can draw. I'm so thankful of the, the guests that we're able to bring onto the show, some great conversations and, and a chance to pick the brain and, and, uh, and, and nudge some thinking or, or get our own thinking nudge from some really knowledgeable people. I'm excited to talk to Clint Cowles today from TD Ameritrade Institutional. Tomorrow, we have Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily joining us on the show again. Next week, as a preview on Tuesday the 16th, we have Gary Dean from Sentiment Timing based in, uh, in New Jersey. And then on Wednesday, Peter Brandt, uh, um, a longtime uh, trader, educator, uh, prolific on social media. It'd be really interesting to hear what charts he's looking at next Wednesday, the 17th. Also, as a quick preview, we are just starting to do some interviews this week for our second season of Behind the Charts. We did our first season last year, had such a great time going to the Money Show, some different events, capturing interviews. This time, we're going to be doing them all virtually. We're doing them over Zoom calls, but some really high quality um, uh, experts, longtime investors, technical analysts, uh, traders, and it'll be really fun to sort of learn the story behind the charts, learn how they are uh, learned to approach the market about their mentors, what they read, what they learned, what they, what they watched, and what advice they can give to all of us as we continue our own journey. So look for announcements on that to be coming soon. Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, I, I call a day like this a digestion day. So we've had some big moves recently, and this is sort of a non-issue day, a non-factor, right? Sort of settling into a certain range. The S&P opened higher, traded much lower, uh, and so it felt like it might be a really nasty day, um, you know, around 11 a.m. And since then, sort of chopped around. The S&P essentially finished flat, and so other things were sort of trading around there. But you know, net net, it was sort of a uh, sort of a sideways day, a digestion day. We sort of agreed on where the S&P should be and didn't fluctuate too far away from that uh, from that level, and not much from yesterday's close. So the S&P still above 3,900. Uh, the mid cap index, small cap index down, not a ton. The small cap index was down about. Uh, a third of a percent, so not a huge move, but uh, leading the way lower out of those three. The Nasdaq 100 down as well. The VIX back up above 22. Uh, looking at some other asset classes, bonds actually up. So there is evidence now that bond prices can go up at some point. So the TLT higher by about two thirds of a percent. The TLT is nearing that 150 level. Ten year yields back down, heading towards uh, 113. Uh, commodities mixed, essentially. Gold was up, silver was down, everything, uh, everything else sort of chopping around here. Oil prices a little higher. Energy was the number one sector in the S&P, up 1.8%. We'll get to that 
in a little bit. Cryptocurrencies mixed, but overall down. Bitcoin down 4%, which is a huge down day by uh, by historical average movements. Uh, that's a uh, that's a huge give back, but uh, you know, back below 45, uh, 45,000. The trend on a lot of these overall has been volatile, but net positive certainly for quite a while. Let's look at a chart of the S&P and then we'll go through some of the other uh, charts that we can find here. So, you know, the daily S&P chart, you know, for me, as, as we've talked about, this is all about, uh, you know, the long-term trend and what we're seeing. And when you take a step back, are we making higher highs and higher lows? Today, we made another all-time intraday high. We did not make a new closing high because we came off uh, closed uh, about mid-range for the day, right about yesterday's close. Uh, but overall, we did make a new uh, intraday high earlier in the day. So continuing that upward trajectory, you know, if and when we have a pullback, if this is the beginning of something uh, deeper, uh, you know, clear lines on the chart where we can look back to. The first one would be that 3750 level. That's the 50-day moving average. That's also the uh, swing low from, uh, from mid-January. Uh, Below there, you would have 3700. That's probably what I would say would be that uh, next big line in the sand. I think you're sort of, you have this uh, this group of things around 3,700 down to 3,600. And that's sort of the, you know, the lows from mid-December. That's sort of the retest that we saw here. I might sort of consider that that next, uh, you know, that first real level to uh, to look at. But, you know, overall plenty of support before where we're at. What's interesting as we continue to make higher highs, I'm noticing the RSI making lower peaks. And again, divergences for me, put them on the list. It's not uh, you know, it doesn't tell me to be panicked yet. It just tells me to recognize the fact that the market's increasing on uh, on lower momentum. The market can resolve higher. You saw that in December, we had a, a momentum divergence and then the prices just kept going up. So continuing to push higher can certainly alleviate that bearish divergence and indicate uh, the potential for further upside. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, interest rates this week. Uh, you know, looking at a chart of the TNX, uh, you know, this is today's uh, give back overall, certainly the trend has been higher rates, lower prices, um, higher rates, steeper yield curves, certainly more uh, positive for the financial sector. Um, so you'd expect uh, the financial sector to do well. You know, we've had some people have talked about uh, the 10 year yield going up to one, one and a half percent, which would certainly be a much, much further move than what we've seen so far. But that is in line with the trend and what we've seen. As always, higher highs, higher lows. It's an uptrend. The inverse of that is the TLT. So even with the little bounce today, we still keep seeing a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. What's interesting to me right now, though, looking at the chart of the TLT, we're right at the 61.8% retracement of the November low to the March high. We retraced 38.2%, 50%. We're now at that final one, and we're having a bullish divergence right about when we're then, which tells me it's sort of, you know, an early warning system that we might be uh, that we might be entering a period of higher bond prices. But for me to be convinced with that, we would have to get above this trend line, which is taken from the August peak. We would need to get above the 50-day moving average. We'd need to uh, make a higher high, which would mean we get above uh, 154 on the TLT. When those things happen, you will hear me start to get really uh, much more uh, bullish language when I describe bonds. Until then, it certainly feels like the path of least resistance is uh, is lower. Um, let's continue on uh, with Bitcoin just very briefly. And again, you know, in general, um, you know, the idea with Bitcoin has been appreciation and you've had a huge run this week after Elon Musk and, and all of that uh, with uh, with the news of Tesla buying uh, buying a bunch of Bitcoin, uh, you know, and basically there's a rotation above uh, 42,000 making a new all time high from there, though, that was sort of it. And we're now starting to give some of that, uh, give some of that back. Overall, the trend certainly remains positive. The challenge with this sort of chart is you can go back quite a ways and still be in a bullish trend because the price swings have been so severe. So I would argue, I could argue, you go all the way down to the 50-day moving average, down around 34, 35,000. You could even go down to 30,000, which would be the swing lows from January, and arguably still be in a constructive long-term pattern. So. Uh, a, 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 an asset class like this, a price series like this has a lot of volatility baked into it. So be emotionally prepared for that one if you're going to be looking at, uh, at, at, at charts like that. In terms of sector movements, let's just wrap up the discussion quickly here. We have energy number one, uh, up almost 2%, communication services number two, followed by real estate and utilities. And I keep seeing REITs pop up to the top here. And again, the reason why I keep bringing it up, I find it's an asset class or a, a sector that most people just don't think about because we're thinking about juicier things that we products that we use and think about more often don't forget to focus on the action of the trends especially the relative strength on the sector basis look at the rrg and see which sectors are rotating higher real estate's not a bad setup compared to some other sectors the worst sector today consumer discretionary down one uh, percent so not a huge give back but uh, but noticeably uh, lower in terms of big movers under armor you've got some earnings names that came out pretty good uaa under armor 
uh, just came out with a really nice uh, earnings win. You can see the move higher at Twitter as well. And again, we, you know, the chart like this, it, this, you know, while the gap higher is certainly impressive and it's certainly newsworthy and it's, you know, wouldn't say it's not a surprise to see the price go from 60 to 67 in one trading day, but hopefully that sort of move is what you'd assume is, is the general trend based on the long-term trend, right? These sort of days don't just happen out of nowhere. They happen during a, a period when the stock has been an uptrend. It's been making a pattern of higher highs and higher lows for a while. The trend has been positive. So don't be surprised by big moves higher and don't make today be the day you notice a chart like Twitter. Notice it earlier when it's on this uh, nice steady uptrend. It's the same thing you'd think about a lot of these uh, names uh, that have been in these long-term uptrends and, and fluctuated, but uh, but overall have been uh, have been netting out uh, higher. There certainly are some names that have struggled a little bit. I point out Akamai Technologies, which is one that's uh, that's come off um, uh, a little bit from uh, from yesterday. And, and again, this is a bit of a surprise only from a technical perspective because the trend overall had been pretty positive. A new 52 week high in January, pulling back to 110, rotating back higher. And it certainly felt in the last couple of days that this was just building up momentum to retest those previous highs and set up. Now this changes things, changes things a little bit because now you're below both of the moving averages. You've now made a lower high, a lower low. Now you have to assume that we're at the very least in consolidation mode. This would be the time when I'd be using Fibonacci retracements, pay close attention to support and resistance. And I would especially say on a stock like this, big round numbers like $100 a share, a lot of times have a lot of important meaning. Important to notice with this chart, we're nearing an RSI of 40, which means overall, if this is still in a constructive pattern, we're nearing about that point where a pullback should be ending before you resume a potential uptrend. That is our market recap for today. We're gonna to take a quick break back with my guest, Clint Cowles. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we look at the market and the message that is, uh, that is embedded in the charts, focusing on the message of the price action. As a reminder, we would love to hear from you and particular questions that come up as you're analyzing charts, as you're reading, watching, hearing uh, anything, anywhere. Uh, let us know how we can help, help you navigate these markets. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment right below the video. We would love to hear from you, answer one of your questions, potentially on the air in our next mailbag segment, which will be Friday of this week. I want to welcome on my guest, Clint Cowles. Clint's a fellow CMT. Uh, Clint's a senior strategist at TD Ameritrade Institutional in Minneapolis. Clint, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. Great to be here. Uh, it's good to have you back. We were talking earlier. I appreciate your uh, recommendations on how to navigate snowstorms. I know you're uh, very familiar. <laughs> you're, you're dealing with the winter right now, and we're, we're going to get wintered here shortly in the Seattle area. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of movement in the markets and, and, and thinking about small caps and the, the, the run that they've had. Start us there and, and tell us what you're seeing big picture. Yeah, for sure. So what I've got up here right now is a three-year weekly chart of uh, the Russell 2000 ETF. Uh, and this has been uh, on the strongest trend that uh, I think I've ever seen uh, out of this year. It certainly came out of the March lows uh, pretty strong, had a couple of a month consolidation right in the middle, uh, and then had a nice uh, measured uh, runaway gap. Uh, right there at uh, in early November. Uh, so the measure gap, they call it that because oftentimes the uh, the run after that uh, equals the run that happened before that. So uh, I've got those red lines on there just measuring what the run beforehand was uh, and then duplicating that uh, up to uh, measure where that would go from afterwards. So uh, that was projecting a pretty strong rally there and uh, we're, we're pretty close to it. So that measure gets us up to 234 uh, and just yesterday you know, we hit, uh, hit 230. So we're getting pretty close to that. Uh, you can also notice there that on the, the volume bars, uh, we still have pretty consistent volume. So, I mean, certainly not what it was right back in March, but you know, nothing has quite that volume. Uh, but otherwise, fairly consistent volume, which is constructive for, uh, for a, a continued rally when we have that uh, supported by volume. Uh, so having the under, uh, 
or the small caps just outperforming like this is uh, is really cool to see. Uh, and seeing that uh, on top of the sectors that have been outperforming over the last three months, I mean, the top four that we have are, well, I mean, there's retail, but that kind of has a different story to it right now. Uh, but energy, financials, tech, and discretionary, and I know that's kind of changed over a little bit just over the last couple of days, but uh, in general, it's uh, it's really risk on. I. The other things that I have on there, I've got uh, you know a 10 and a 40 week moving average, and this is the weekly chart. Uh, you know those cross over each other way back in July and have just been pulling it apart, which is just a further sign of strength. Uh, our RSI that I've got uh, towards the bottom is pretty significantly in overbought territory, uh, and our MACD is definitely very stretched to the top side here as well. So. I, it's, uh, you could say the count is full here on this. We have had uh, quite a run, and at some point uh, in the not too distant future, I would be expecting a little bit of a pullback, but uh, the signs really aren't uh, pointing to that uh, on the small caps quite yet. So I'll certainly be looking for those, uh, a little turn down in uh, both the RSI and the MACD, and then potentially even just coming back to that 10 week moving average, getting a little bit of a pullback. The now, if we go over That's to. That's such a great way to, uh, to describe that, by the way, Clint. I love that. Your, your next chart is looking at the S&P 500. How does that relate to small caps? So it's not quite as uh, as strong here. I mean, it's certainly still been in an uptrend. We've got our higher highs. We've got our higher lows. Uh, you know, all of our moving averages crossed over. And this is a daily chart, just a one-year daily chart. And I've got a 20, 50, and 200 period moving average. So those have all been in the bullish position that we'd want them to be since all the way back in June. Actually, we like to see price on top, then the short-term moving average, then the intermediate, then the long. So we've been in that situation for a long time and still uptrending. Uh, there are a couple of uh, kind of red flags. I uh, hear one is the RSI divergence, which you just mentioned there too. We know that's not necessarily just go ahead and sell your entire portfolio, but it is telling us that we have a little bit weaker momentum. Uh, where it is right now, uh, and I've mentioned this once before on the show, uh, I really like using Connie Brown's ranges for the RSI, and its divergence right now is hitting right on that 65 resistance point for the RSI. So a little bit more concerning that it's uh, it's below that overbought territory there too. Uh, and then also looking at the volume. So if you look at the volume bars there, uh, this rally that came off of the low from uh, a couple of weeks ago has been on pretty uh, minuscule volume there. So we're making new highs uh, on very low volume with divergences. So uh, that is giving me a little bit more of a uh, confidence that this is probably going to have a little bit of a pullback uh, with a high correlation between the S&P 500 and uh, the small caps. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all for that to uh, to kind of follow through. Uh, and we may have seen a little bit of that kind of starting here today. Uh, now, if that were to happen, I, like you were mentioning before, the support level is there along the 50 day moving average upsloping trend line. Uh, and then there's also a decent amount of volume right about that same point. So what I have over on the right side is a volume profile. Uh, and this is just showing how many shares were traded at each price as opposed to uh, on each day down below. Uh, and where there's spikes there, those usually act as support and resistance levels as well. So uh, I'll pull back to one of those uh, and then having a bounce coming around off of that uh, would be fairly expected. Now, what I saw on the IWM there was that really strong rally up there. I, I try not to bring Ellie, everything back to Elliott Wave. The guys on my team, I'm sure, would say I fail at that. But uh, that is definitely a, a third wave rally up there, the longest and strongest uh, movement that we get. Uh, it doesn't look like we've quite gotten that in the S&P here yet, but I think we have had a one, two, and then maybe a start to a third wave rally here. So if we get that little bit of a pullback, bounce up off of that support, the very bottom line that I have here is the relative strength versus uh, the small caps. So if we can get a bounce off of that support, I would expect that uh, the S&P or the large cap here would start to outperform the small caps since this would be then going into its third wave L8 wave. Uh, so what I'll be watching for is for the uh, relative strength of the S&P to break back above uh, that downward sloping trend line for the small caps there to start that third wave rally. This is this is such a great rundown. I really appreciate it, Clint. And I love thinking about the the I hesitate to use the word frothiness, but it's come out of my mouth a number of times recently. But relating that to the big picture and seeing with the S&P sort of this nice, consistent uptrend. Clint, it's so good to have you back on the show. Wish you and those around you stay safe and uh, be well. And we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. That's Clint Cowles. Clint's a, uh, a CMT. He's the senior strategist at TD Ameritrade Institutional. And, you know, again, I love that sort of take. I, you know, a lot of what Clint was saying just made a lot of sense to how we've been talking about the markets in particular, you know, seeing some red flags. You talk about, you know, a full count. It certainly feels like you have these signs of divergences, lighter volume 
all of which are characteristic of bull market tops. And, you know, I would argue just the one thing we haven't had that is characteristic of a bull market top is the price going lower, the price stopping going higher. And that's what, you know, that's the scenario we continue to see. So we'll be interested to see uh, how this all, uh, how this all plays out. Uh, awesome to have Clint back, on, Clint back on the show. Continuing on here, let's go to our next uh, segment, which is called Compare and Contrast. Uh, here, what we're basically going to do is uh, is occasionally look at two different things, two different markets and how they relate, or two different ETFs, two different stocks. And and what this does is it really parallels a lot of the um, you know sort of the investment approach that uh, I would do at a larger investment shop. A lot of times, what we would do is have to compare, contrast different markets with one another. Think about how this one thing relates to the other, how these two are, are lining up and determine if we had to pick one, which one would you pick and why? And that was a, a great way of differentiating uh, two different uh, decisions or, or you know, comparing one to the other, thinking about where your conviction should be, where you should lean into, where you should lean away from. Uh, and so let's go through that process today. What we're gonna do is look at two stocks that are, uh, that are in uh, earnings this week, Uber and Lyft. On the left side, we have Uber. On the right side, we have Lyft. Very quickly, if you're not familiar with how to do this, this is using the gallery view. So at the top of stock charts, where it says sharp chart, if you select gallery view, if you type a ticker, it's going to give you the ticker uh, and it's going to show you that stock, an intraday view, a daily view, a weekly view, and then the point and figure view at the top. Uh, if you add a second ticker, just put a comma, a comma, a comma. It's like I was from New Hampshire all of a sudden, sorry, a comma after the first ticker and then add the second one, um, you get the two of them together and you actually compare them. This is such a great way to compare two different things that you might be looking at. As a reminder, my charts may look a little different than yours that you can customize your gallery view charts by using our chart styles. If you don't understand what I just said at the top, there's this little gray message and the blue uh, link. Click on that link and it'll explain to you how to set up some charts because mine are going to look a little different because I've customized them uh, you know, for the timeframes I want to sort of look at. So let's compare and contrast these two. Looking at the earnings calendar, so uh, Lyft actually came out yesterday after the close. Uber actually is coming out right as we're reporting, or I haven't looked at the results yet. Uh, so as to not cloud my view, let's focus on just the charts and then we'll see uh, how things react afterwards. So we're gonna start with the intraday views. This is looking at the last five days. You know, obviously both of them have, have bid up pretty well going into uh, their earnings release. Um, this is Lyft, which actually reported yesterday. So you can see the gap higher uh, after their uh, their release yesterday after the close. And then that was pretty much the high for the day. You can see it sort of tapered off uh, back there and, uh, and and came lower, settled into close around uh, 56. So still almost 5% higher than, uh, than yesterday, uh, but giving back some of the gains that it had overnight. Uber is actually appreciating a lot more going into their earnings release today. You can see the Lyft actually sort of chopped around uh, the day of, uh, of earnings, whereas Uber is appreciating. That certainly indicate, you know, people aren't buying into the stock going up to their earnings release if they uh, expect that things are gonna get, are gonna get worse. So, uh, so that's certainly a little bit more of a, a little bit of optimism, uh, you know, potentially uh, leading into the, uh, to the release. We'll have to see how things play out and what, reacts at, what reaction we see afterwards. The daily charts actually look very similar. You see both of these have gapped higher uh, in November, a little bit uh, different configuration in terms of uh, lift on the right, which had the peak in June, kind of came off, made a really steep low there in October. So while Uber was actually holding up, making a higher low here in September, October is when the market peaked in September, sort of chopped around a little bit and then broke higher in, uh, in November. You can see the lift was actually giving a lot of those gains back. That's most obvious in the relative strength where you can see the relative strength of Uber going higher. You can see the relative strength of Lyft going lower. So I've often uh, told people, and I was, I was quoted once in, uh, in Walter Deemer's book, I, I made a presentation and said, I never look at a chart without relative strength. And that was absolutely true uh, at the time. We're looking at individual stocks all day. And that was the way that you differentiated chart A from chart B is look at the relative strength line. And in general, you want to own stocks where the relative strength line is going up. And I would still argue that is something that individual investors especially don't do enough of. Um, it's not enough, I think, to just look at a chart of the S&P and see how they look visually relative to one another. Look at the relative strength line and, and make sure that you're focusing on stocks where the relative strength line is appreciating, where it's rated high on the scooter rankings, which is the stock charts technical ranking. It's a based, you know, a measure of relative strength uh, relative to its peers uh, in its market cap range. So overall, at this point, both of them actually in a pretty similar configuration. You can see both of them, uh, you know, held up pretty good going into the end of last year. You can see they both sort of gave back uh, a little bit and both to broke to a new swing low in mid to late January, and now both of them have now rotated back 
and made a new high. This is today, uh, Uber made a new 52 week closing high. Same thing for Lyft, but this is after earnings yesterday and came off. So it'd be interesting to see if you get a similar gap higher or what sort of movement you have relative to what Lyft did uh, today. Finally, we have the weekly view. And um, in this example, it shows you how limited history we have of these. Both of these are relatively young companies, relatively young stocks. They've been around a little bit longer, but in terms of their public listing and what we're looking at here, the data is relatively limited. You're only two years uh, going back here. And you can see both of them you know, really were struggling in 2019 after their, uh, their IPOs. You can see they came down. Everything got hurt in March, but these were already in pretty much established downtrends. Neither of them had gotten anywhere near their IPO price. The real difference, if you look at the two of these from left to the right, here's Uber on the left trading at $63 a share, well above its IPO price. Lyft, on the other hand, has still not regained its IPO price. It's, it's, it's continued. Most of that time has been spent uh, uh, much below there. When you look at the weekly charts, though, I think it's also note, worth noting for both of these, the weekly RSI on both of them overbought. And while that on its own is not the end of the world, you can see they were both overbought uh, you know, at the end of last year and then have continued to go higher. That doesn't bother me as much. Actually, I would argue it's more often than not more of a good thing to have a stock that is in a long-term uptrend that becomes overbought on those, on those upswings. That's a sign of a healthy uptrend with the stock able to push higher and demand continuing to, uh, to increase, continue to build what you call maybe buying power uh, evolving over time. So that's overall pretty encouraging. The question I would I would have for any of these, given any sort of earnings miss, any, given any sort of pullback, are we able to to hold its most recent low? And I think, you know, on, on Uber, you're looking at 47.50. On Lyft, you're looking at 43 to 44, which would be the lows from January. Those are held on a pullback. And I think overall, you're, you're in good shape. Also, the 50-day moving averages, which are a little bit above there. So just like with the S&P, as long as you hold the 50-day on a pullback, as long as you continue to make higher highs and higher lows, I would argue the trend is higher until proven otherwise. That's a segment compare and contrast, really focusing on trying to differentiate these two. These are actually two very similar stocks. But if you focus on the differences, where are they at in terms of how they spent mid-2020? Uh, where are they at relative to their IPO prices? You can start to understand how they relate to one another, and especially on an earnings week. Look at how they relate to earnings uh, You know, leading up to the announcement, after the announcement, how do investors anticipate and digest that earnings win or earnings miss? We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three. Three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P percent advancers decliners. We look at this uh, occasionally, not, not all the time, uh, but uh, but certainly we do sometimes. And this is basically, you know, usually when we look at advanced decliners, it's a cumulative measure because it's a long-term breadth measure, in my opinion. I like seeing how the advancer decliners are, are moving or evolving relative to uh, to the price of the index. Here, we're actually looking at the daily advanced decline rate, sort of looking at daily volume on the S&P and just getting a day-by-day -day read on it. Today was a digestion day. It was a bit of a give back, but not really that much. And the way that I would uh, validate that is by seeing that it was about 50-50 between advancers and decliners. A big distribution day when there's profit taking, when there's selling, when there's distribution, you'll see the red bars uh, hop up a lot quicker. This is an 80% plus uh, distribution day here at the end of January. This is the big uh, moves uh, lower as, uh, as we uh, started to sell off going into uh, into the last week in, uh, in January. So we have not seen that yet at this point overall, uh, half stocks are still closing higher every day. Chart number two is the bullish percent index. This might not be quite updated for today's trading just yet, but it's worth noting this usually we look at on a point and figure chart, but it's basically what percent of members of the S&P are in a buy signal or a sell signal using point and figure charts. It's currently almost back up to 70%. Above 70% is sort of the long and strong, everything's good, sort of signal and we're getting near back to that uh, back to that level late January when the market pulled back a bit we saw this go back below 70% which is called the bear alert it sort of suggests potentially we're starting to see some internal weakness as stocks break down never got below 50% and now rotating back higher that getting back above 70% i would argue would be sort of a a check in the plus column in terms of potential for further upside in stocks Finally, take two. So all the video game makers, take two, Activision, Blizzard, Electronic Arts, all have reported earnings uh, in the last week now. Take two actually pulled back a little bit this week after their earnings release. If you look at the long term, you can see this group has done pretty well. The S&P uh, is here in blue. This is starting uh, at the uh, at the market low March 23rd. So you can see Electronic Arts has underperformed just a bit. The other two have outperformed pretty well. But while Activision has gapped higher, Electronic Arts has appreciated take twos actually pulled back a little bit. So when you think about comparing and contrasting, this is an interesting group to uh, think about. I actually just put a video on my own YouTube channel, Market Misbehavior, focusing on Take-Two Interactive using Fibonacci 
retracements. Folks, that is our show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday for the final bar. A special thank you to Clint Cowles from TD Ameritrade Institutional for sharing his thoughts today. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.